we have uh, an incredibly exciting guest um, who's joining us uh, for a fireside and Q&A um, to finish off, uh, which is Chad West. He's the Global Marketing and Comms Director at Revolut, which is a very proud seed camp portfolio company. And, you know, Chad's really been on the most exceptional sort of journey from, from joining as, I believe, Marty High number one to, you know, now being in a position where Revolut is one of the most loved um, fintech unicorns in the world, um, has multiple millions uh, of customers and is, you know, an absolute, absolute uh, rocket ship of a brand. Um, I remember, I think actually Chad, this might be the closest we've ever come to an actual face to face. Um, but I think Chad is also the epitome of absolute hustle and grit. I remember like way back in the day when you were contacting me like, we want to come and give out free cards. We need to give out free cards at Google Campus. Can we come and get access? And now they're like launching Asia, launching Americas. They don't need to give out free cards to nobody. Um, but Chad has played an absolutely massive role um, in getting Revolut to where they are now. So Chad, welcome. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Very good indeed. Um, do you want to give everyone a little bit of an intro as to just, I guess, who you are and how you got your start at Revolut? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been at Revolut over, come February, it'll be four years. Um, so as you said, I was the first hire uh, in, in marketing and comms for the company. And I think at that point, we were somewhere in the region of 25, 30 people. Um, so yeah, it was it, it was interesting. I still remember when I um when I, I interviewed at Revolut, I um it wasn't a name I'd heard of. Uh, I'd heard of I'd heard of some of the new up and coming companies like Transferwise and things. And I went into Revolut initially thinking, Joe, I haven't interviewed in a couple of years. Uh, I need to get some of the rust off me. I, I'll use this as an opportunity to do that. So there was not a part of me really, if I'm being honest, that was taking it that seriously. Um, but then I went in and, and from meeting, I think it was three, pe six people over three hours, um, I met and then from meeting them just absolutely blew me away in terms of what was emerging in the FinTech market at that time. Um, Revolut's ambition was to be 10 X from a product perspective, from a customer perspective, from a geography perspective. Uh, and we've lived up to that. And I remember people, friends, family, colleagues saying, oh, you're crazy. Why would you not go to a big name? And uh, needless to say, they're they're not laughing now. So it was a uh, yeah, pure right time, right place sort of uh, type of thing. Yeah, amazing. Uh, they're definitely not laughing uh, now. So what was you mentioned? You had sort of you know that three hours intense interview. What was the makeup of the team um, at that point? And can you give a bit of context, I guess, to how that's evolved to where you guys are at now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's about. 25, 30 people, give or take, uh, and almost everyone was technical. So they were either front-end engineer, back-end engineer, operations, or data science. Uh, and like one, one, what two compliance people, one finance person. It was, it was pretty much, but a, but a super technical team. Um, and I remember I joined, and I was like the outcast from from what from who that you know what the kind of people these were. You know, these were all graduates from Imperial College with you know, first class degrees in, in physics. Uh, and so it was, it was quite a culture shock in that sense. I mean, even before Revolut, I worked at uh, Rocket Internet, which is, you know, really successful uh, business and really bright people. But Revolut just took it to a whole new level. And I remember the um, general counsel, Tom Hambrick, joined a week later. And then we became good buddies because we were quite similar in terms of uh, not being hyper technical um, people. But that was literally the team. It was just in, intensely product focused. Um, and then it's only at that point Nick was Nick and Vlad were, were starting to take the, the other areas of running a business a bit more seriously. I mean, I remember when I walked in and interviewed Nick. Um, I mean, there's a bit of similarity, right? Because he, he, he's a Russian guy. He's very straight talking. Uh, I'm, I'm Scottish. I'm quite straight talking as well. So I think a lot of people would have been quite intimidated sitting in front of him and like taking his questions one after another. But like, I, I just, I, I'm used to it. So I, I think we gelled off quite well. And one of the first questions he said to me was, um, I just want you to know I don't believe in marketing. An investor told me I need to hire someone. You're not going to get a budget. How are you going to do it? And I just looked at him and went, yeah, no problem. So first thing we're going to do, and he was, I think he was a bit taken aback by that. So it was, um, it was a funny experience. Reshma, was that you who was asking, uh, saying that they needed to get a marketer? Um, on, on that note, how did you kind of 
help or, or sort of work alongside Nick and, and the rest of the team to actually build their confidence in marketing and what it was you were doing. So I think this, this issue happens a lot, right? We see yeah. really technical founders and, and just this like, oh, we kind of need to do this thing, but we don't even know what good looks like. So what, what kind of, how did you take them on that journey with you and, and build their confidence? I think the key thing was, I think Nick had confidence that I knew what I was talking about. Um, and and he, gave me, he gave me complete freedom and autonomy. Um, he, he wasn't micromanagement. He wasn't overly involved. It's one thing I loved working about Nick. He, he doesn't have an ego. Um, he hires people because they know something he doesn't and he lets them do it. I think a lot of founders struggle with that, right? Um, sort of a control freak nature. Um, but I think... You know, the reality was I, I knew what the strategy had to be, but, and, and I'll talk through what that strategy was, but what's more important is you've just got to deliver, right? Ultimately, you're not going to convince them and they're not really going to have that full confidence that, you know, you're one of them and you can do this until you start to show some data and prove that you're, you're earning your keep, essentially. Um, and that's what I had to do pretty quick. So my logic was, right, let's start with the low-hanging fruit and then let's, let's, let's take it from there. I think the reality was no budget. I was thinking to myself at the time, you know, what is the strategy here? Equally, I was a one-man band for, you know, the best part of eight months um, while I was there. And uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, it was post-financial crisis. Uh, confidence and trust in banks is as low as it's ever been. And for me, that was a huge opportunity to really build customer loyalty. Um, I think I resonate with some of the things that have been said in here. I, I, I speak in you know, conferences all the time about marketing and you hear the technical marketers talking about how it's all important. They use all these words like CAC and CLTV and it's meant to sound super uh, technical and 90% and of the time it's, it's kind of nonsense. I think certainly when you're at a startup stage, you've got to focus on your number one marketing channel, which is your customer, right? You've got to build that brand loyalty because if you're able to win them over, your scaling strategy for marketing is going to be a lot easier as you go forward. And ultimately you should get to a point where hopefully 60, 70% of your daily acquisition is either referrals or word of mouth. Um, I know that's been the case at Revolut. I know it's been the case at other companies like Monzo uh, and others as well. So I think for me, initially, I was like, how can I bring customers as close to the brand as possible? So one of the things we did was um, loads of customers were constantly going on our community forum saying, I want this, I want that, do this, do that. And it was hard to sort of manage that. So similarly to some other brands, um, we put our roadmap public on a, on a Trello board. Basically, here's what's coming up in three months, six months, 12 months. Uh, and then it was public, so customers could then go on to that and upvote and downvote what they wanted us to prioritize and not. So we blasted out comms, so email, push, banners in the app to all customers saying, you know, you're, this is your company, right? You're part of this. It was like a really human tone of voice. And suddenly customers were flocking to it uh, and, and per, per product had, you know, 3,000 upvotes and one had, you know, 6,000 downvotes because it wasn't a priority. Uh, and suddenly customers were getting that flavor of, well, Revolut clearly does care because it's really asking us to dictate their product roadmap. Um, that was good for us as well because it meant from a data perspective, we were actually building products that were going to deliver uh, and not thinking we had the answer ourselves. And then for the sake of time, we sort of took that further and further. So we started running monthly community events across all of our metropolitan cities. So not just in the UK, but also in Paris, in Berlin, bringing in two, 300 customers every six weeks, uh, pizza, beer, decks, we exciting speakers, great products. So people felt they were actually meeting the team. They were part of a community. We made it quite networking. So we brought other companies involved to help out. Um, we then decided we wanted, how can we take it a step further? And that's where we said, let's make customers investors. So let's run crowdfunding campaigns. Um, and I remember at the time we projected, I think, you know, one of the rounds we did with them, um, yeah, you know, I think it was Cedars. Um, we only wanted to raise, I think it was 4 million. And we knew we'd hit that pretty quickly because we put out some data to say, if you could invest, would you? And it was insane how many people came back. So we knew we only needed like 10,000 investors and we had to cap them at this amount to make sure everyone got a fair game. But to really show people's brand loyalty, there was a bit of a growth hack there, which was if you want to invest in Revolut, you've got to invite two friends, like demonstrate to us your commitment to this brand. And then suddenly it went bonkers and we were doing, you know, that, that resulted in like 250K signups or something daft like that um, because people were, you know, so enticed by the brand. Um, and there's so much more to it, but I'm conscious I'm ranting on. But it was all about how can we bring the customers close to the brand as possible? And the wider strategy was how can we make our customers work for us? How can we make them want to scream and shout and tell everyone they know? And that was through a variety of different areas, but that's um, just a few of the ones that kicked it off from startup stage towards scale up. Incredible. Um, 
as part of that, because, you know, Revolut, the tone of voice has always been really human, really down to earth. You guys are just super direct and say it as it is. Was that a conscious decision? Like, did you guys do some work when you came in thinking like, this is who we are, this is what we're about, and this is how we're going to deliver it to the world? Or did it just sort of evolve naturally? No, so it, it, was, it was purpose. So I'm a big believer in that a lot of the brands you see are shaped from the personality of their first marketer. Um, and like one of my main passions is writing, right? Um, and I mean, it's funny, my, my background in writing is really interesting because, you know, I, I, I've spoke about my background before, but, you know, I, I grew up in like the care system and I, I flunked school. It was pretty rough, but I loved writing, even though I wasn't good at it. I mean, I remember a point where I was so bad at school that I could barely tell you how, how a comma worked or how an apostrophe worked. And then I, and I really got my act together a little bit when I got a little bit towards 15, 16, and I started reading newspapers. And every day that was my thing of, if I'm going to learn how to write really good, I'm going to start reading the FT. And the, the content was so boring for me, but it, it really made me understand how to write and what the right punctuation was, grammar, spelling. Um, and then from there, I just became obsessed with creative writing. So it's all, even to this day, I'm still hands-on when it comes to copywriting and tone of voice um, at Revolut. But the main logic was, you know, I had banked with Santander all the way through uni, and whenever I got correspondence from them, it was jargon, it was corporate, they were using banking terminology that I had no idea what it meant, and the average person wouldn't. I didn't feel like I was speaking to a person. I felt like this is just some robotic text, and I don't really understand what they're asking me to do or what they want me to learn. So my logic was we need to make sure that whenever we communicate with a customer, it doesn't matter whether it's a push notification, an email, a social media post, that we speak to them like a friend. And I remember when our when, when I, I mean, I hired a, I did it initially, and then I hired a phenomenal head of copywriting, uh, Graham, and, um, his name was, who only left us recently, actually. So go on to bigger and better things. But um, I stuck a post-it on his head one day that just said, speak to, your, speak to customers like you speak to me, because we sat opposite each other. And uh, he just sort of took it to scale. Um, so the logic was, let's actually show that we're humans and we're real people. But more importantly, let's make sure that when we communicate with customers, they understand exactly what we're trying to tell them. How do you maintain that human element as you guys obviously scale to the massive size that you are now? And as you launch into all of these new markets, do you find that there are nuances you have to be thinking about in terms of internationalization and with the brand and with the tone? Or, or are you able to sort of keep it relatively consistent and that you feel sort of still very comfortable that everything going out is still like revenue stamp approved? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. I think, uh, scale poses issues right and i think you have to remember as well revolut's not a tech company like uber or airbnb we're a highly regulated financial services company um and that comes with barriers uh so i think the reality is as you get a bit as you start to scale and become more of a mainstream brand and your target audience suddenly goes beyond young millennials and you're trying to appeal to everyone you need to kind of find that balance of we had a bit of a really fun Tone in, tongue in cheek, a tone of voice. Maybe we now need to moderate it a little bit and make it a little bit more appealing to wider audiences. And it, and it does make sense, right? Because I know that if you know my, my you know my mum got an email with emojis in it and and stuff like that, would she be reading it, taking it seriously? I'm not sure. So I'm we're trying hard. I think the hardest part of my job today, uh, for sure, and and, it's, and and I've been there and done this before, I guess, is. Once you get to a certain scale, things start to change, right? You become a bit more corporate, a bit more bureaucracy comes in. You maybe have to hire some politicians from the traditional industries, uh, and, it's, and it's hard. And I think that's why you typically see an influx of people after four or five years moving on, right? Because they've taken it as far as they can, and they want to go back to their roots. So uh, it, we're still maintaining it, but I think certainly it's about finding that balance. And then equally... Think about the challenges as you go to new markets, because while this tone of voice might work really well in North America and Europe, maybe if you go into more conservative markets like Asia, it doesn't. Um, so I think it's also about taking into account uh, your expansion plan and whether all aspects of your brand make sense in those parts of the world. How have you, as within the marketing team, thought about international expansion? Have you gone and been on the ground in new markets, helped train people up, or have you quickly sort of you know, brought new people in? Um, what's been the approach there? No, so I think that the chunk of what I do now, no, not entirely, but a good 
50% of what I do now is on expansion markets. I think the good thing about Europe is we built our core function. We, 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 Revolut's quite a hyper-technical place. I think we make no secret of that, right? You need to be data-driven. You need to be f fluent in SQL. And, and you, know, you need to be quite technical, even if you're in marketing, especially if you're in marketing. Um, so I think for, um, for us, it's about you know, not doing a copy and paste job in, you know, we can't just pick up the product and the brand in Europe and drop it in another market. I think there's such an important factor of you have to go to that market and you have to hire great local people who understand the landscape, understand the culture, uh, who can then bring that to life. So we're big on automation. So one thing we do at Revolut is, you know, Europe's a fine oiled machine, right? Processes are operated, things move, growth goes up. But then we build playbooks to make sure that when we go into expansion markets, we try and test everything that we know works in our, in our home markets of UK and Europe. Um, but we give local teams a lot of freedom and autonomy to do their own things as well. So I was out in Australia for the launch. I launched Singapore. I launched the US. Um, I haven't been able to launch Japan uh, because of COVID. We just launched a week or two ago. Um, gutted. Um, but so, yeah, I've been on the ground there and I've really got a good understanding of, you know, how every, every market's different. I mean, the most important thing for any marketer is product market fit, right? Before you agree to join a startup or whatever, answer yourself the question, is this solving a problem that has mass appeal and no one else is? And if they're not, they're trying to duplicate. So let's say a challenger bank starts up next week, forget about it. The market's saturated, there's already big players, you know, find something else. So for me, I look at these markets and think, okay, maybe Revolut's product market fit is its budgeting and analytics aspect here because the banking structure is so bad. Or maybe go, I go to a market where banks charge skyrocket fees. So our USP and our product market fit is going to focus on FX and travel and international remittance. So I think it's what I'm trying to say, not in short detail, is you know really implement your playbook and expansion markets and try and test what works. But more importantly, get that data quickly and then nail your strategy down on what is that low picking fruit for that market again, uh, because then you can sort of expand beyond there, but you've got enough to really work with. Um, and they're all different markets, so. Super interesting. I think that importance of being able to dial up and down, like I said, a messaging or tone of voice or what have you, depending on the area that you're launching into is, is so critical rather than just assuming you can like drop, like plug and play the same thing and absolutely. <laughs> Um, on that, and we, you sort of just touched on it as well, like, uh, you know, it's no secret that the challenger bank space is relatively crowded right now, like Revolut was obviously a, an early adopter, like early to market, and also just an exceptional sort of product uh, that people love and an insane um, kind of ability to launch new products as well and, and sort of be where customers are and give customers what it is uh, they want, perhaps even before they realize they want to need it themselves. What, how do you think that might not be strategy to <laughs> ignore that sorry uh yeah how do you think revolute's marketing strategy differs to sort of other challenger banks in the market and then as well what advice would you give to people who are building companies in a crowded space when it comes to thinking about their own marketing or, or how they can think about creating standout yeah i think that's my partner trying to get in i'm saying go away go, 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 go. <laughs> Stay outside. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> um won't be happy uh I think it's a good point. I think one thing that really frustrates me is how people band Revolut, Mondo, and Starling together. I, I, because we're, Revolut is so... I, I can see why you'd band Mondo and Starling together. That makes complete sense because they're basically the same product. Um, but Revolut is drastically different and, and in so many ways, right? So if you look at our vision of what we're, what, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a financial super app, right? So if you look at the impact that super apps have had in Asia, when you look at WeChat, when you look at Alipay, when you look at Grab, right? It's encompassing many things into a single app and giving the best possible customer experience. In the world, there is not a, in the Western part of the world, there's not a financial super app, right? There's not one app where you can manage every aspect of your financial life seamlessly. Um, so, you know, in many countries, including the UK, you'll have one app for your banking, one for your stocks and trading, uh, one for your cryptocurrency, if you do that, one for your FX and remittance. That's four different sets of user terms and conditions, four different fee structures, four different UI and UX, and the list goes on, right? So Revolut's been able to encompass the day-to-day -day banking aspect, the foreign exchange aspect, the cryptocurrencies, the commission-free stock trading, and that resonates and makes sense to people. So when I look at these other guys, they are just trying to go and be in my opinion, metro banks, right? To go and challenge some incumbents and do very, what we know is fairly simple domestic banking. 
Um, Revolut is doing so much more than that. You know, the complexity of our product, you don't see that from a user perspective, but from a back end, the complexity of our product um, is, is just a million miles ahead. I'm not even going to hold back, right? I think on the same part, people often say as well, um, oh, you know, but you're the same in, in, in other ways. And, and I look at it in a bigger part, you know, for example, at one point, Monzo had the same number of employees as Revolut. It was about 2,000. But Revolut's in 28 European markets, and we were in two international markets. These brands are just UK only. So they've got the same number of employees focused on one, albeit relatively small country in, in, in the grand scheme of things. So I used to often have to explain to people that, you know, I mean, I, I know Tristan and, and love him to bits at Monzo, and we have a chat all the time, but I have to remind him and say, you know, my job's way harder than yours. Because I'm looking, you know, between me and the rest of the growth function and Revolut and, and comms and everything else within it, we're, you know, we're marketing in, in France, in Germany, in Ireland, in Poland, in Romania. That's different cultures, different languages, different key selling points, how we market. Now we're into North America, Australasia, uh, you know, Asia. So I think it's different in terms of the product and, and, what, and what our goal is of what we're trying to build but equally the fact that Revolut is global uh, and not just a one territory company. That global point is really key. And what, how long into the, the Revolut journey um, before you guys went global? And then I'm gonna uh, open up some great questions we've got coming in uh, from some of the portfolio. Oh, uh, what was our first expansion market? Uh, so the first one was Australia. Uh, and technically it was, uh, I mean, outside of Europe, this is, I'm speaking. So outside of Europe, because we launched all over Europe at the same time. Um, but our first market was Australia. And we launched the beta phase of it last year. Um, but then we officially opened the floodgates earlier this year. Um, so basically, we were doing a lot of trying and testing uh, to really nail the product in that market. So technically speaking, 2020 has been the year of Revolut Global Expansion because we've opened up Australia, we've opened up uh, the U.S., We've opened up Singapore, Japan. Um, I don't know what's to come next. We'll have to, to wait and see. But um, I think that's the key thing for us. And, and you can think about it even from a mark. If you want a little marketing example of why that's a great thing. I mean, historically, trying to send money from, say, the UK to the US would typically take three days on average. Uh, and you'd also pay remittance uh, fees on that, right? So you might get charged from your bank, maybe the bank receiving the money. It's a bit of a pain in the backside, right? But if you have Revolut in the US, and your colleague has Revolut in London, uh, you can send money to each other instantly and for free. It's a cross-border peer-to-peer payment. And I've been testing it for weeks now, sending money instantly back and forth to my colleagues in Singapore, in the US, in Australia. That's never been done before. So Revolut, in my view, is the first company to truly tear down financial borders. A lot of companies say this term, but in reality, they're not doing it, right? Just improving it by a day or taking away the fee is, is not really achieving that goal. I think you've got to do both, right? Instantaneous, free. Um, and that's a great marketing trick as well, because suddenly if we have customers who, who are in the US and are frequently sending money to Europe all the time, why would I not have an, an automated system messaging them saying, hey, if you just convince your friends to get Revolut in Europe or vice versa, you can send money to each other instantly for free. So it has this viral effect as well, where people are like, amazing, my daughter studies in Europe or my, my brother lives here. And it has this effect where like you have to get Revolut. And from a product perspective, we make that so simple to make those referrals, which is why even today, 60, 70 percent of our daily acquisition is still linked to people referring someone to the product. Wow, that is insane that referral is still so high um, you know, at this point in the journey. Um, Chad, thanks so much. I'm going to uh, flip over some questions. Uh, Deshan, you had a great question around some of the early experiments. Do you want to uh, jump in um, and add some color to what, what you're asking about? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much, Natasha and Chad. And uh, the interview story you shared was great. I'm just wondering, um, I'd love to hear more about what were the first thing you did at Revolut and what were the first experiment you run uh, to kickstart growth and particularly like how do you manage everything on your own? I'd um, love to hear more of your early stage stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, th I think at that time it, it was, I had to be realistic, you know, what can I realistically do? I'm a big believer in don't half hour some things, whole hours one thing. Um, I've tried to be that person of 
doing everything myself, trying to run loads of things, and you end up doing a fairly average job in all those areas, right? But when you put everything into one, maybe two areas, you can really nail it. So I think the first thing that really, you know, it's crazy, but the first thing that really drove in the growth uh, was PR. Um, I'm fortunate to have a background that's directly split between marketing and comms, um, even at Revolut. So at that point, you know, we had this unique product. Um, no one was really talking about this side of finance, right? They were talking about, you know, domestic banking. They weren't really talking about FX and remittance and foreign exchange. Um, and I too, and I knew that to stand out, we would have to be quite aggressive. So I made sure that in terms of the tone of the press releases that we were sending out, that they were really not anti-bank, but clearly trying to demonstrate Revolut as this kind of Robin Hood figure. Um, and that sort of resonated with a lot of journalists, but more importantly, that resonated with people because suddenly you're clicking on Business Insider or TechCrunch or the Financial Times, and you're hearing about this company that's talking down the banks. You agree with that in your head. We all do, right? Um, but on top of that, it's then plugging exactly what your product's doing and why you can back it up. And suddenly people are thinking, God, as a European, we travel like four times a year, uh, three, four times a year. Why would I not get this card if I don't have to pay any fees? So this, honestly, by doing continuous consumer and corporate PR on a week by week basis and blasting out great stories that were data driven or were focused on thought leadership interviews, um, we suddenly saw not only was our brand awareness rising, um, but more importantly, our customer acquisition um, was going up. I mean, at one point when we were averaging about 200 signups a day, post PR, that shot up to six, 700 per day. Um, so that was one area. I think the second part was the, the referral side of it. I think there's often people think that you need to put money into referrals. Now we have at a later stage because we wanted to blitz scale, right? But when we were initially doing product referrals, we were quite cheeky and we were honest with customers. I remember the first email we sent asking them to do it was, look, you love this product. We know you do because we can see that you use it. Bit creepy, but it worked. Um, and what we said was we have some money and we could go spend it on doing billboards and going on you know, TV, but we'd rather put it into the product and make this even better for you. So all you need to do is help us tell your friends and family. So it was basically Revolut's way of saying, we have money, but would you not rather we spent it on you? And if you can just do a little bit of the legwork and help us out. And the, the reception was amazing. The, the copy was so condensed, it was short and sweet. The, the tone of voice was incredibly human, a little bit cheeky, and it just resonated with our audience. And then they kind of got thinking, yeah, I do love your product. And like, I'm, I know you put our interest first. I've, been on your roadmap public, I've been going to your events, sure I'll tell my friends and family. And then of course we made it the case of a two-click process to make it as simple as possible to invite a friend, not to overcomplicate it so people you know drop off and fall off. So the, the advice I always give is is really focus on what that that driver is that brings them in the door, whether it's PR, whether it's social media, whatever your person what works for your brand. But then think about that second part of how can I then get those customers to work for me uh, and help me grow further. Very cool. Um, Guy, you had a question as well around uh, how nobody can be a full stack marketer. Uh, do you want to shout out, um, take a bit more detail, uh, chat, chat about that question? Yeah, yeah, I stand by it. Um, I think the reality, I mean, Natasha, I'm probably preaching to the choir, right? But you'll know yourself, marketing has changed so much over the last, you know, you could say five years, but, you know, five, ten years. Um, and the reality is so much is now brought into the marketing team, right? In terms of all the various different functions. So I think for anyone to sit there and say, I'm a full stack marketer is complete nonsense. There's no way you've devoted years of your life to be becoming an expert in PR, in social, in content, in uh, product marketing, in paid performance, in BD, in sales. You haven't, right? You might, you, I, I pride myself in being a, a good at quite a few of them but I'm not all of them. And I think that's the importance. I think what I was getting at when I was talking about this is, you know, becoming a, a more senior marketer is hard, right? When you're working in a startup company that's growing at hyper growth rate, you as an individual need to grow at that hyper rate. Because if you don't, especially in the world of startups, you'll get replaced or you'll get someone above you. So you've got to really figure out how you can scale at the same pace as the company. And that means that you know where your strengths lie as a marketer and where you don't, you've got to fill those gaps and fill them fast. So I know that I'm pretty good at, pretty good at paid marketing. It's not my, my forte, but I know I'm not good enough to you know, completely run that and get the best out of it. So I'm going to hire a head of performance marketing who's best in class. So 
that's the logic of my point there. Stop trying to pretend you can do everything yourself. Stop pretending you're an expert in all aspects of marketing because no one is. Um, and where you, you know, own what you do well and fill in the gaps where you need to. That makes and just, sense. And like when you talked about the kind of early strategies, like actually like going hard on things like PR and, and words and tone of voice and being human, like I guess if you lean into the bits that you as the, the first like marketing hire are actually excellent at and make those like exceptional. Um, and then perhaps, you know, sort of think about how you can like get your way through the other bits and then also bring in people to help support on it. Um, then for sure. Guy, were you jumping in with? with yeah, I was just, I was just going to sort of add on to the end. I guess you said you were the first marketer for the first eight months. Did that for that sort of eight month period, did you just focus on your sort of strengths or did you sort of try and do sort of an assortment of everything? No, that's, that's a great question. Um, there were definitely periods where I tried to take on more than what I was capable of doing with the hours in the day. Um, but I think I realized them pretty quickly that I was half arsing some areas. And my view was I need to get growth on the board. I need to get the charts going green, not amber, not red. Um, so at that point, that's where I really identified what am I very good at as a marketer and what are the low hanging fruits that I can capitalize on to really get this machine moving. So at that point, it was content and social. It was the brand aspect of community engagement, of tone of voice, uh, PR, uh, and uh, the product marketing side of it. So they were the sort, and, and that's, that's still a lot for one person, right? But the reality is, and you'll know this, if you love your job and you wake up for it every day, you'll, you'll, you'll work the hours, you'll do it, right? Because it's your passion. And a big reason we join startups is because it's kind of your company as well, right? If you join at an early stage and you get the decent equity package, um, it's partly your company. So it's not a job, right? So I think I still probably took on more than, you know, I say what I should have, but, um, but I really did harness in and focus on what I was good at, what would bring the numbers in. And then when I finally got the budget, that's when I started to fill those voids. Perfect. Thank you. That's really helpful. Very no, cool. pleasure time and your poor partner that we've left hanging outside um, quick, <laughs> not going to be happy with you um quick question i guess like we've talked about a lot of the positives and insanely amazing things you guys did um in the early days what do you reckon has been one of the biggest marketing flops um, <laughs> save the best till last um how to get it in, how to get it in? So I'll be honest. Uh, I mean, I pride myself in being a, a straight talking Scotsman, right? And some people love it. Some people hate it. I'm okay with that. Um, now this for me isn't a flop fully and whether you consider it a flop or not depends on where you sit on the woke spectrum of how easily offended are you, right? And unfortunately I come from a part of the country where we have a sense of humor. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we did a, I remember, Oh God, two years ago, maybe now we, um, had leftover budget and we had three days to spend it or we'd lose it. And I was sat down with a few of the team at that point and I was like, we need to do something on the cheap that will get high impact. Um, and the logic that we came to at that point was, well, if we look at the data, this style of campaign works really well. And it was essentially the, the Spotify ad of like using data to tell stories. Um, but we wanted to take it a step further at that point and say, okay, well, let's make fun. So let's look at data and see how we can poke fun of things. So we went on the tubes with these ads and it was basically using partly data to tell interesting stories. So at that point, you know, Pierce Morgan was furious about vegan sausage rolls. So, you know, we wrote something like to the 7,600 customers who bought a vegan sausage roll, Pierce is furious. Um, and the goal was Pierce Morgan would see it because he goes on the tubes and we tagged them on social and stuff. He didn't engage with it, flop. Right. Um, but then there was one that was, you know, to the 17 and a half thousand people who ordered a takeout on Valentine's Day. Are you OK, hun, or something? And that's the one that basically got dubbed uh, single shaming. I mean, we were all single at the time. So, I mean, we didn't know that clearly why. Um, but basically, you know, your typical Twitter mob. Uh, went to Twitter and started moaning and, and it got national press coverage. So it was in the BBC, the Guardian, BBC Radio, every UK newspaper covered it. Maybe not a flop, depending on where you sit. And the sentiment was, what's interesting is when I, I'm, I, I, I go with the data, right? I don't go with the opinions of, you know, some random Twitter user going on a rant, right? I look at the data and I, when I looked at the sentiment of social mentions and looked at the sentiment of comments on media articles, it was 80% either neutral or positive. 
because the general sentiment was people saying it's funny or the other half were saying why are people offended by this why do you care like and then you had the 10 20 percent who you know are the social justice warriors uh, and take off so it depends where you sit in the spectrum but at the end of the day some people were offended some of the newspapers said it was you know a bit a bit gimmicky a bit a bit a bit childish and maybe they're right um i still look back at it and I'm, I'm split down the middle when I when I have the data in front of me. But um, if you speak to some people, they'll probably say it's that. I mean, I still remember it. So I'm going to take it. I didn't even realize it was two whole years ago. So I'm, I am I classed it as a sort of all publicity is, is good publicity, if I'm quite honest, because it started a conversation, right? Um, and it didn't feel sort of like too far removed from actually Revolut and your tone of voice and actually what you're about normally, right? That you are quite human, that you're not afraid to sort of, you know, take the piss a bit um, and just be straight down the line. So yeah, I, I remember it very well indeed. Um, Chad, thank you so, so much for your time. It's been awesome. Um, I appreciate you running over a little bit longer with us. Um, such an exceptional journey that Revolut has been on. Look forward to COVID being lifted and seeing which market you can, uh, fly off to and, and be able to go and launch next as I'm sure you do I'm in Greece tomorrow so that's, that's oh, all but that's, that's personal that's, we, got, uh, we got you just in time Chad thank you so so much let your poor partner in take care bye bye cheers bye. Bye -bye.